Hello everyone, my name is Nicole Ouellette, and today I'm going to present a case on hyperlipidemia. Rodney Sullivan is a 56-year-old male. He presents for an initial physical exam to establish care. Uh, he does not have a previously established PCP. His vitals when he comes in, uh, blood pressure 148 over 92, heart rate 88, uh, temperature is 36.4 degrees, and he's breathing at a rate of 18 respirations per minute. He's 5'8", and he weighs uh, 238 pounds, not on any medications. And the nurse helped him complete a family history chart. And his father has a history of high blood pressure, cholesterol issues. He had a heart attack in his 50s, and he's obese. His mother is also obese. She was diagnosed with diabetes late in life. She also has high blood pressure and fibromyalgia. His brother is obese and has cholesterol issues as well. When we talk about family history, Mr. Sullivan recognizes that a few things run in his family. So he might be at risk for diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, heart disease, um, we're going to start with blood pressure. So we talk a little bit about the regular, the norms for blood pressure. Uh, he trusts my opinion that 130 systolic is a reasonable goal. He seems to understand that healthy lifestyle changes like diet and exercise would probably lower his blood pressure. Uh, he tells me, I think I know what to do. It's just a matter of doing it. Just thinking ahead about things like what I'm going to eat before I actually get hungry and just stop at Burger King. So we're going to continue to encourage those healthy lifestyle changes, but today we're going to start him on lisinopril 20 milligrams daily. We will educate him on things like angioedema, hypotension, um, don't take the, this medication with NSAIDs, and also a dry cough might be normal. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time focusing on this drug though. Goals for physical fitness, we'll talk about that too. Give him a brochure of indoor and outdoor activities that are available for him. Uh, in terms of labs that we're going to order, we'll, we'll get a hemoglobin A1C to rule out diabetes, uh, CMP, CBC, and a fasting lipid panel. Um, indication for that is the family history of cholesterol issues. Patient agrees to follow up in two weeks after his labs are taken. So two weeks have gone by. Mr. Sullivan comes back to the office to talk about uh, the labs that he had drawn and management of his blood pressure. Systolic's down to 140, so that's progress. Hemoglobin A1C is 6.1, so he is pre-diabetic. Triglycerides are 982, um, slightly elevated. Total cholesterol is 232. High density lipoproteins 28 and low density lipoproteins 106. So Mr. Sullivan asks, does this mean that I need more medicine? Because I'm not taking Trilopex. My brother doesn't even take his because it's too damn expensive. Uh, well, before we answer him, let's think about a few things like what do we even think is going on? Um, what are our options for treating? Before we move to the next slide though, I wanted to talk about this picture here on the left. They call it strawberry pink blood. Um, it's ex extremely lipemic. It's unofficially called strawberry pink blood, by the way. But um, this was actually taken from a three month old. His differential diagnosis was familial hypercholesterolemia or familial combined hyperlipidemia. His serum triglyceride was, actually his uh, total cholesterol was 890, I believe. But I put the link down here I did find the picture on Google, but I had to uh, log into the USM um, site, to the library site, to actually get the article. But yeah, this is pretty crazy. I've seen blood drawn before, but it probably wasn't this light. Um, they say that triglyceride blood that you draw that is high in triglycerides will kind of be milky, and I'm not sure if it is different from total cholesterol, but either way, pretty crazy. First, we'll talk about risk factors, and then we'll talk about treatment. In terms of non-modifiable risk factors, Mr. Sullivan is a 56-year-old Caucasian male. His father and brother have issues with their cholesterol. 
modifiable risk factors are his hypotension, which we're working on, and also obesity. Um, I used the uh, Hippocrates BMI calculator to calculate a BMI of 36.18, which would put him in the class two category of obesity. Um, also modifiable, he's got a sedentary lifestyle. He's a current smoker. He drinks two to three beers every week or two. Emerging risk factors. We haven't tested for any of these yet, but they would include an elevated CRP, fibrinogen, homocysteine, lipoprotein, small dense LDLs, and coronary artery calcification. Another consideration is atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk score. Um, I use the Hippocrates site to find the 10-year revised pooled cohort equation uh, from 2018. Factors affecting the score are that he's a 56-year-old white male his total cholesterol is 232, HDL 28, SBP 140 on medication. Um, ultimately, I chose non-diabetic because the options are yes or no for diabetes, but he is a pre-diabetic. I'm hoping that since this is a modifiable risk factor, we'll get his hemoglobin A1C down with lifestyle changes. He's also a current smoker. So as it stands, his 10-year risk is 25.6 but it would be 12.3 if you were not a smoker. Um, so what does this mean? Well, I checked out the 2013 ACC AHA prevention guidelines and they present four statin benefit groups. And I understand that when they talk about statins, they're talking about cholesterol, more so in terms of LDL. Um, the, let's see, they, with this risk, they categorize him into group four. And so individuals without clinical AS, CBD, or diabetes who are 40 to 75 years of age with an LDLC 70 to 189 and have an estimated 10 year um, risk score of greater than or equal to 7.5%. So um, that's where he's at for LDL. His main issue is his triglyceride level though, and statins I recognize are not the first line therapy for hypertriglyceridemia. I included Fredrickson's classification of dyslipidemia. I thought it would be interesting to take a look at a few potential differential diagnoses. I also listed his lipids here um, we can see that his total cholesterol would be considered borderline high. It's over 200. His HDL is less than 40, so it's low. Normal LDL. For his 10-year risk of 25.6, we would want his LDL to be less than 100, but I would say he's pretty close. So I would be comfortable finding drug therapy that lowers triglyceride and increases HDL. We, when we take a look at the chart, we know that he has a family history of cholesterol issues. Um, at this point, we don't know his lipoprotein levels, so the differential at this point would include familial combined hyperlipoproteinemia, mixed hypertriglyceridemia, and dysbeta lipoproteinemia. Those are all differentials that have both elevated total cholesterol and elevated triglyceride, but we will know more when we get levels for very low density lipoproteins and chylomicron levels as well. Another thing to talk about in terms of differential diagnoses would be ruling out a T4. We haven't done that yet, but if he has hypothyroidism, then this would slow his lipid metabolism and cause high triglyceride levels, so we will be sure to do that as well. This table is kind of presenting some of the things that we've already talked about. I pulled this from eMedicine, and um, Mr. Sullivan would be categorized of the first row of risk, so 10-year risk greater than 20%. Um, 
Non-HDL, we can calculate that by taking total cholesterol minus HDL. Mr. Sullivan's is 204. So we know, we know the goals for cholesterol, but triglycerides, we haven't talked about that yet. I would say for the short term, we can set a goal of less than 500. But long term, we will probably need to be establishing care with a preventative um, lipid clinic or cardiology clinic. These are the medications approved for major triglyceride elevations. Fibrates are the first choice, also known as fibric acid derivatives. They include gemfibrozole and phenofibrate. We'll talk about those a little more in a minute. Uh, niacin is vitamin B3. Omega-3 fatty acids are also a choice. Statins are not in this category, being technically approved, but they may generally reduce lipids by up to 50%. So in some cases, they're approved as um, complementary therapy, uh, for example, to fibrates. I believe uh, Trilopix is compatible with statins. This slide compares sphenofibrate and gemfibrozil. Um, big differences, gemfibrozil has no effect on LDL, while phenofibrate might decrease LDL about 20%. They both seem to increase HDL and they both decrease triglyceride. Uh, the second column is what you'll see if you combine this medication with a statin. The third column is outcomes data, and the fourth is just odds and ends that you can take a look at if you're interested. So I've decided I'm going to be ordering phenofibric acid. And I know that Mr. Sullivan is not thrilled about taking Trilopix. Uh, fortunately, there's a generic brand. Uh, there's a generic form of the medication, phenofibric acid DR, and um, per GoodRx, that costs 44.22 for a pack of 30 capsules at Walmart. Um, the dose for hypertriglyceridemia would be 45 to 135 milligrams PO daily, and the maximum is 135. Um, you can adjust the dose every four to eight weeks. I'm thinking I would start at 135 daily, 135 milligrams daily, that is, and expect to see a 20 to 50% decrease in triglyceride levels. Uh, the mechanism of this medication is that it inhibits triglyceride synthesis and it stimulates catabolism or breakdown of triglyceride-rich lipoproteins. And yes, this was approved for combination therapy with statins for the treatment of mixed dyslipidemia. And um, that might be a medication that we need to look into at a later time for Mr. Sullivan. So I don't see any apparent contraindications for Mr. Sullivan. Um, we will monitor his creatinine and LFTs both at baseline, but then also every three months or so, and then periodically unless it's indicated otherwise. But I'm hoping that he will be getting into a lipid clinic or have a cardiologist manage his, um, his hypertriglyceridemia. So they might have their own idea of what is um, appropriate for labs. We'll also get a CBC with those labs and every three months for 12 months, HDL at two months after he starts his treatment, but um, again, we'll probably look at consolidating the times that he has to show up to the lab clinic and see what the lipid clinic has in mind. In terms of food and drug interactions, he does, have, he does drink um, two to three beers every so often, so I would ask him to reduce his intake to one instead of two or three when he does that on the weekends, and then Probably try not to drink the alcohol at the same time that he's taking the pill. So I would encourage him to wait four to six hours uh, in between taking the pill and having a drink. 
Also avoid red yeast rice. This is a medicinal, medicinal food supplement that's also used for lowering cholesterol. Um, Gatu cola is a, the herb of longevity, which is contraindicated with this drug. Also kava, and you know, you don't want to eat foods that are high in fat or cholesterol while taking this medication um, because that kind of just defeats the point. Uh, oh, it looks like things got a little slipped up here, but adverse reactions would include liver issues like hepatitis, cirrhosis, um, cholelithiasis, GI issues, indigestion, nausea, vomiting, constipation, angioedema, myopathy, rhabdo, Steven Johnson syndrome, which is that rash that people get, um, sometimes like flu-like symptoms preceding the rash. Uh, hematological issues would include thrombocytopenia, a granulocytosis, or uh, thromboembolism. And I would also tell him that if he does miss a dose, then he can take the next dose as soon as possible, unless it's a few hours away uh, from the next dose, and then he can take that dose early. I included niacin here. It's another treatment option. It's not the one that I'm going with, but um, one of the reasons why I chose not to is because it may increase your blood sugar, and I thought that was inappropriate for him. The mechanism of this drug is tissue respiration oxidation reduction reactions. <laughs> um, it decreases the hepatic triglyceride esterification. I also included a slide about statin therapy, which might be used in the future in combination with the phenofibric acid. Um, I included that monotherapy with the statin is not recommended for, for Mr. Sullivan. Um, again, if he used this medication, his alcohol use would be contraindicated. Just try to decrease it. With this medication, he would have to avoid grapefruit juice um, because it could allow for buildup of Lipitor and that might encourage muscle breakdown. Um, so feel free to pause any of these slides to check it out in further detail. But in terms of this presentation, I think that's all I have prepared. Uh, please email me or get in touch if you have any questions. Thank you.